I'm just delighted to be able to uh, welcome you to the Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue at SFU for the BMO lecture, uh, which, as Danny says, is also combined with the uh, President's Dream Colloquium, uh, a colloquium which uh, is dealing with entrepreneurship. In fact, it has this great title. I love this title, Looking for Entrepreneurial Opportunities in All the Usual and Some Unusual Places. So I'm not sure if this is one of those unusual places, but I'm glad that we could gather here today to uh, discuss issues relating to entrepreneurship. I think it's fitting that the BMO lecture is associated with this year's colloquium because the purpose of that lecture series is indeed to bring distinguished academics and business leaders to SFU to address uh, issues concerning business and administration and economics and related subjects. So it's a wonderful uh, synergy with what the theme of the colloquium is uh, for this year as well. And some of you may know that the uh, Dream Colloquium was launched in 2012 very much as part of our vision for Simon Fraser as an engaged university. The idea being that we uh, would benefit from a colloquium series that would bring people from different disciplines together to interact, faculty, students, staff, and to really create a conversation within the university, and in this case, a conversation we can also share with the external community. Uh, I, I must say I was really excited when the theme of entrepreneurship was chosen for the uh, Dream Colloquium for this year uh, because uh, the theme of, of entrepreneurship runs so well through the university and is reflected in so many of our, uh, of our programs. Uh, whether it's the entrepreneurship education that BD provides, not only in the business faculty, but right across uh, other disciplines uh, throughout the university, or our Venture Connection program, which allows students in any discipline to have an idea that they have for a product or a, uh, an innovation, to have that idea not only tested, but brought to market with the support of, of entrepreneurs and our own uh, mentors, or uh, whether it's uh, BD's recent initiative uh, to create a social uh, incubation uh, center and lab, uh, Radius, to uh, use business ideas to really inculcate uh, thinking about how we can improve society uh, through entrepreneurship. And I could go on with many other initiatives, but suffice it to say that entrepreneurship is a theme that I think uh, finds expression in many parts of the university and is hugely important to our future as a society uh, not only economically, but socially, environmentally, and so many other ways. Uh, with that, I really want to thank uh, those from the Beatty School of Business and the other faculties, as well as our Graduate Studies Office, who've been working so hard to make this colloquium series possible. Uh, that includes Professor uh, Eric uh, Godulovich and the members of the organizing committee who are listed on the screen up here. They have lined up some great speakers to address topics such as science and technology, financing, social and cultural entrepreneurship, and indigenous entrepreneurship. And I really encourage you to show, out for, show up for uh, some of the uh, rest of the uh, 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 talks in this series. In fact, there's one uh, on the Burnaby campus uh, tomorrow. I also want to thank the sponsors. Uh, that's the BMO Lecture Series Endowment Fund, the BD Family Visiting Fellows Endowment Fund, the Office of Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Fellows, and SFU Vancouver, along with my, my own office, which kicked in some uh, funds to make it uh, possible for us to, to have this series of lectures. And before we get started, I just want to mention that this event is being webcast, and it will be made available later on uh, the colloquium website, along with the other lectures in this series. So if you miss any or you want someone to see uh, a lecture that you saw that they didn't, there'll be a chance to do that. And after the lecture, I understand there'll be a chance for questions and comments so we can continue the conversation at the reception to follow. So with that, I want to turn the, uh, the microphone back over to uh, Dean Danny Shapiro, who's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Danny. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Saul Estrin. Uh, it's a pleasure because he is, of course, an eminent scholar, but it's also a pleasure because uh, I have known Saul for, I think, more than 30 years. Uh, so for 30 years, our paths have crossed in a variety of capacities. Uh, for 29 years, we talked, discussed, debated, planned, wrote one article, um, which <laughs> was published in 2009. 
after 25 years of planning. Um, but uh, it's a good article. Uh, Saul began his, luckily most of his co-authors weren't like me, so as you'll see he has published uh, a lot more uh, than that. Uh, Saul began his uh, academic career at the London School of Economics and uh, in the early 1990s moved to the London Business School where he was uh, the ADECO Professor of Business and Society and the Director of of the uh, Center for New and Emerging Markets, something that will uh, be important in a moment. Uh, he was also, at the time, at, uh, while he was at London Business School, the Associate Dean and uh, Interim Dean for a time. So part of uh, the intersection of our lives was, was around uh, deaning. Saul left the London Business School uh, and returned to LSE uh, in the last few years, where he became head of the uh, uh, the Department of Management, which, which is equivalent to a dean's job, and that is a position he held until last year when he returned to uh, being a teacher. And I have to say he looks pretty good for it, um, for having left deaning. Uh, during the time, uh, his time at LSE and LBS, and then LSE again, Saul has established himself as uh, a really important scholar in the broad area of comparative economics, economic development, and comparative business. His work has, for many years, looked at the development of countries and companies under different institutional settings, under different conditions of ownership, under different political regimes. So he began as a specialist in Eastern Europe, uh, looking at uh, the, emer the growth of what is uh, the former Soviet Union, looking at the nature of uh, firm behavior under a planned economic system and state ownership. With the fall of communism, uh, he moved into looking at the effects of privatization on firm behavior. He is probably one of the world's authorities, leading authorities, on the nature of privatization and the behavior of privatized firms, the way in which privatization occurs that is successful and the ways in which it is not. He then moved into uh, a large number of studies on what are now called emerging markets, uh, looking at entry conditions uh, and the emergence of private sector firms in uh, a variety of emerging market countries, ranging from uh, China to India to um, China, India, Brazil, and Russia, the BRICS. Uh, so what distinguishes Saul's work and, and what you will see tonight is uh, really two things. One of them is his very careful attention uh, to data and his sophisticated use of data. Saul's work has always been within a very careful context of data analysis. That has resulted in his work being published uh, in some of the best journals in economics and business, ranging from the Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, to the Journal of International Business Studies. But the second characteristic of Paul's work, uh, Saul's work is that it is consistently relevant. It is consistently of interest not just to academics, but to those outside the academic community. His work on privatization, his work on the emergence of the BRICS, his work on understanding the importance of national contexts in uh, a variety of ways uh, has been important to uh, both international organizations such as the World Bank and UNCTAD that have engaged him as a consultant, and to a variety of companies who have benefited from the courses that he offers internally, which have helped them understand and grapple with how you do business in those countries. And those companies uh, include uh, British Airways, British Telecom, Marks and Spencer, PwC, Vauxhall, and a long list uh, of others. So tonight, uh, Saul, I think, will engage us by bringing his great sense of data together with uh, what is really a very relevant and important question, which is how 
entrepreneurship activity varies across countries and why. And he will look at that both in, in a broad way and in a somewhat narrower way. So please welcome uh, Saul Estrin. Is that working? Um, well, uh, a bit nervous to begin after a uh, build up like that, really. Um, I, I, it seems to me that this can only go downhill from here, but I'd like to thank um, um, Andrew and, 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 and Danny for their fine introduction, Eric for organizing this in the first place, and I'm delighted to be uh, back in Vancouver again, uh, a terrifically beautiful city. Um, and what Dan is sort of summarised slightly better than I'm going to be able to do what I wanted to do in this uh, lecture, which is, is to try and take, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a moon-level view of entrepreneurship across, across countries. I want to stand back from it. I'm not going to be talking about the specifics of what makes this particular person succeed as an entrepreneur and that person not succeed as an entrepreneur and what particular element of uh, financing, venture capital, crowdfunding helps this versus that sort of... One. I'm not doing that at all. Right? We could do that, but I'm not going to do that at all. What I want to try and do is basically say, if you look across countries, there's really a lot of difference in how much entrepreneurship we see and there's a lot of difference in the types of entrepreneurship that we see. And why is that? Right? And where I suppose I'm going to try and get from that is to, the, to, the, to think about, well, if we begin to understand why entrepreneurship differs, we might be able to build environments which are more uh, supportive of entrepreneurial activity. So that's the, the, the broad purpose of all of this. Um, I think I better sort of start, just in case I run out of time at the end. Um, <clears throat> if you look at entrepreneurial activity, it varies a lot across countries and by type of entrepreneurship. I'll give you a few examples, right? Some of you would have seen in the... In, um, um, I think it's last week's Economist. There's a very interesting paper by a Swedish economist called Henriksson, uh, who proposes a new measure of entrepreneurship, which is the number of billionaires. Have you seen this, Danny? The number of billionaires that are entrepreneurs in each country. And if you follow that particular measure, you get uh, an indication of how entrepreneurial countries are, which perhaps accord somewhat better with the measures I'm going to give you today, the, you know, the most entrepreneurial country in the world that I'm going to show you, I've forgotten which one it is, but it, I think it might be Trinidad and Tobago or Uganda. I'm not quite sure. But, and you might be saying, well, there's got to be something wrong with the way you're measuring it. And, of course, there is something wrong with the way we're measuring it, and I'll talk about that later. But the first thing, therefore, is we're going to talk about what I'm going to call high and low impact entrepreneurship. Henriksen's trying to focus on high impact entrepreneurship. If you go to the OECD or you go to the World Bank, they're focusing on all entrepreneurship, and most entrepreneurship is what in North America you call mom and pop shops, right? And that, it's not about creating Apple or, or Google. And so that distinction is an important one. The second thing that I think is quite interesting is, is the, uh, between male and female engagement in entrepreneurship, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the third distinction in terms of type of entrepreneurship I'm going to talk about are between uh, commercial entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. That's the distinction I'm going to call. So what you might call regular entrepreneurs, I will refer to as uh, commercial entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs, we'll, we'll define them a little bit later on. So the first purpose of this talk is simply to try and pin down for you the extent to which there is variation in all of this across countries. Right? Let's get some stylized facts. The second thing I'm going to talk about is what explains this variation. Well, lots of things explain this variation. The, thing that I'm going to, the, the things that I am going to look at are the level of development. Roughly speaking, if we measure entrepreneurship in a very inclusive way, right, the poorer the country, the more entrepreneurship you get. 
Okay? And that's a slightly counterintuitive result, and I'm going to talk about it. Secondly, I'm going to say uh, something which, when I told Danny this, he sort of rather gently pointed out this is virtually tautological. But nonetheless, he, the idea is that essentially the better the institutional arrangements, the more entrepreneurship you'll get. Now, of course, this is sort of tautological because one of the things you might say about a, a definition of a good institution is it encourages entrepreneurship. So there is a certain circularity, but I'm going to try and find a way of identifying what I mean by, uh, by institutions which is separate from entrepreneurship and see if we can build those relationships. And thirdly, but I won't spend a lot of time on this because I think it's covered in other lectures and it's covered more in the press, uh, finance is quite important. So arrangements, capital market arrangements are quite important for entrepreneurship. So the variation is explained primarily but not entirely by those three factors. Other important things include culture and education and I'm going to talk very, very briefly about that. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the interrelationships between these types of entrepreneurship, right? You might be beginning to think to yourself, well, does male entrepreneurship drive out female entrepreneurship or does it support it? Well, the answer, to save time, is it, 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 it all depends. There's no simple answer to that. Does commercial entrepreneurship drive out social entrepreneurship or are they mutually supportive? The answer to that is they're mutually supportive. So that sort of thing is my last theme. So they're essentially what I'm going to try and do. What is the variation in entrepreneurship around the world, what explains the variation, and what's the interrelationships between the types of entrepreneurship. So that's, you can go now actually, uh, if you want. Um, right. In terms of the talk, I'm going to, you know, this is an sort of academic talk, I'm going to define things first. I'm going to talk about why the national context matters, and then I'm going to talk about commercial entrepreneurs and the subcategory of that, high-impact entrepreneurs, then I'm going to talk about female entrepreneurs, and then I'm going to talk about social entrepreneurs. If you want to think about what entrepreneurship is, you know you're going to start thinking about creativity, you're going to talk about leadership, you're going to talk about learning and talk about innovation. You know the sorts of things that it is. You know the sort of word association things that go with it. What is an entrepreneur? Well, there's loads and loads of definitions. I'm going to put mine up here. It seems to me that any definition would require all of these four notions simultaneously. Firstly, you have to be able to perceive and create opportunities. Right? Entrepreneurship is about perception and exploitation of opportunities. Now, as a very brief aside, but a very profound one, there are two ways of thinking about this. One is the one that comes from Kurtzner. And Kurtzner's view is essentially that an entrepreneur is an arbitrager. There's an opportunity there, and by exploiting that opportunity, the entrepreneur drives the economy towards an equilibrium. There's an alternative view, the Schumpeterian view, in which the entrepreneur does the same thing, sees an opportunity and exploits it, but drives the system away from the previous equilibrium. It opens up entirely new possibilities that weren't previously there. And you can imagine different situations in which you could have both Kurtznerian and Schumpeterian, uh, um, uh, Schumpeterian entrepreneurship. So that's the first important element of the definition the second important element is that entrepreneurship is obviously, uh, you can't think about it without thinking about uncertainty and risk. It's, it's, it's pivotal to the notion. Thirdly, I think we need to have in mind the idea that the firms that will be created will succeed. Paul and my, uh, uh, um, Danny and my for, former colleague, Paul Jaroski, did a lot of work in, on this. As a, the studies that he did uh, uh, in the 1990s indicated that across Europe, at least, about 60% of all firms fail in the first three years. And I don't think this has changed terribly greatly since. Survival is a very important element of entrepreneurship. Lastly, and this is how economists tend to think about it, entrepreneurship is an occupational choice. If you choose to become an entrepreneur, you're choosing not to do something else and it has an opportunity cost. 
And therefore, you have to think through the implications of that choice, that labour market choice. So that's our definition. That's the place we're going to start. Have that in your mind in everything that follows. Well, entrepreneurship is fundamentally about seizing opportunities. What, if you thought about this, would drive that? Well, first of all, you've got to ask, are you motivated to seize those opportunities? This is about your character, your attitude to risk, for example. Secondly, is it possible to seize those? Right? I think there's quite a lot of difference in your opportunity to see your, your ability to seize opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities in Canada or in Putin's Russia. And this is related to institutions and institutional structures. Thirdly, are there enough of those opportunities? Right? And that, of course, depends on your level of development and on capital markets. And lastly, of course, we've already talked, what types of opportunities are there? Are they social opportunities? Are they commercial opportunities? Are they high impact or not? So that is the... That's, well, that's the end of my introduction. As Danny says, I never like to walk very far from data. Let's have a look at entrepreneurship around the world. This is, uh, all the data I use is based on the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. There are other measures. Uh, I reckon this is the best. It covers, it's gone since 1996. It covers now about 80, 85 countries. It's based on samples of at least 2,000 people in each country. Uh, it's like a labour force survey, effectively. Um, what do we find? Well, what, what we find is that uh, Zambia, at least in the year that I've chosen here uh, uh, in 2011, is the most uh, entrepreneurial country in the world. 40% of the population are engaged in entrepreneurship, of the working age population are engaged in entrepreneurship. The bottom of the pile is Slovenia, uh, uh, where about 3.5% are engaged. The UK is about a third of the way up. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, which has been the winner in some years, is, is also quite high. Uh, if my memory serves me right, Canada's about here, but a little bit hidden. <laughs> You'd probably like to see... So my main point is that's a hell of a lot of variation. A variation of ten times. Let's see if we can pin that down. Let's look at developed economies. Well, roughly speaking, developed economies, I've just taken uh, a, a small sample of each, right? Um, roughly speaking, developed economies fall into actually three categories, right? But I've only done two here. The first is relatively high rates of entrepreneurial activity, right? United States, Iceland, and actually Canada. Okay, all fairly high. 10% of the population in any given year is involved either in creating a firm or running a, a firm that's been created in the last three years. They are fairly high. And then the bulk, actually, of developed countries, where that rate is about half of the North American rate, 5 6%, that's Germany, France, Japan, and so forth. There's some variation through time. Some countries like Japan see a sort of upward shift but for the most part, the variation through time is cyclical. Is that okay? If I start looking at less developed countries, you immediately see I have some super countries for entrepreneurship, Ghana, Vietnam, Nigeria, and so forth, where the rates are 30 35%. I have a bunch of countries uh, where the rates are pretty damn high, like Colombia and Argentina and Thailand and Indonesia. And I have a bunch of countries which are uh, about the same as the United States and Canada, uh, like Turkey and Mexico and South Africa and Egypt. Okay? So what you've got amongst the developing countries is a much wider range. But the lowest rates of entrepreneurship are about the same as the highest rates in the developed countries. So why does national context matter? Well, it matters 
as I've said, because the national context generates the opportunities and your ability to seize them. I'm going to talk in, in this about up to five things. I'm going to talk about the level of development, individual characteristics. I'm not going to talk about education much. I'm going to talk about institutions, and I will very briefly mention culture. Right? These are the key factors. Let's start with the level of development. This is probably the most important slide for you. It pins down, I mean, underneath it, there's regressions and God knows what, and there's papers on this. I've even written one of them. Um, but this makes the point. Entrepreneurial activity is inversely related to the level of development. The poorer the country, the higher the measured rate of entrepreneurial activity. Right? As you'll see from this, right, if you didn't have some relatively poor countries with very low rates of entrepreneurship, right, which may be cultural, for example, Russia and Pakistan, this would be a much steeper curve. Okay? And if you remember the previous slides, you, you saw there really was quite a big variation between developed and less developed countries. Why is this happening? Why are um, developed countries, uh, uh, why do they have uh, lower rates of entrepreneurship? Well, I think this can be summarized in the opportunities for entrepreneurship are much greater in uh, less developed countries. Why? Well, especially Kurtznerian opportunities. That is to say, the, the ability to arbitrage opportunities, to imitate, to copy, to transfer uh, technologies and skills. All those opportunities are much greater. Right? And at the same time, the, altern the opportunity costs are much lower. There aren't loads of alternative competing highly paid jobs. And so it's not surprising we see a lot of entrepreneurship in relatively poor countries. And you re really have to bear this in mind. I don't, it's not important for what I'm going to say exactly, right? And you're going, you might quite rightly, like Henriksen, as I was saying earlier, come back and say, but I don't mean, you know, I the guys that are in Ghana uh, selling whatever uh, um, uh, food on stalls, I don't mean that as entrepreneurship. Right. But it is entrepreneurship, right, in this context. It's, I mean, it, it certainly fits our definitions. But it's not Schumpeterian or high-impact entrepreneurship. So that's, I suppose, the first big result. Now I want to turn to institutions. Now, William Baumol... Uh, well, I think I'm right in saying he's still not won a Nobel Prize. Is that right? He's not won one, but though it's slightly odd. Um, William Baumol in 1990 developed a very important argument which captures once again what I think many of you would think of as common sense. He basically said, look, probably the best thing to assume is that the supply of entrepreneurial talent is the same in every country, right? You may want to argue, oh, no, 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 you know, the, the, I know the, the, uh, uh, the British are lazy and slovenly and the Canadians are entrepreneurial. You may wish to argue that, but I think it'd be very hard to identify. His argument is, as a starting point, let's say the supply of entrepreneurship is constant. Then we see very big variations in how much entrepreneurship there is. Why is that? Well, he says that this is to do with incentives and institutions. And he says what's going on is if you have the right institutions, and of course I'm going to spend a lot of time on what I mean by the word, the right institutions. If you have the right institutions, what people will do is undertake entrepreneurship, which he calls productive. That is to say they will create national wealth. On the other hand, if the institutions aren't right, those same entrepreneurial people will not go out and create businesses. They will go out and seize rents. They will become rent seekers. Right? Why, if the, it, and it's not to do with them. They're the same people. 
It's to do with the institutional arrangements in which they work. They will become non-productive. And then, of course, with the worst set of institutions, those entrepreneurial people will become criminals. And it's not that they will fail to add value. It's that they will reduce the value. They will reduce national wealth. Right? So that is his laying out of the way incentives, incentives operate and institutions operate. So what are the important institutions? Well, essentially, I call it the literature, but it's, it's actually mainly my work, I'm afraid. Um, um, two key elements of the quality of institutions are important for entrepreneurship. When you're thinking about cross-country, I mean, I want to stress, when you're thinking in this cross-country way, Eric and others have done work also cross-country, but much more about uh, particular institutions in particular contexts, but this is about explaining cross-country differences. Two, the first is about property rights, the nature of property rights. Now, well, I've got another, the next slide, I'll go into more detail on this. But the key thing about property rights is this. If I make a contract with Danny, right, and then he doesn't deliver, I can sue him. And, assuming your legal system works, I will get, I will get redress from that. And so the property rights system and the rule of law underlies the principle of voluntary contracts on which a market system is based. Okay? If I don't have that, it's much harder to have voluntary exchange. And it's particularly to have, hard to have voluntary exchange in any area where there is risk or where capital is involved. But that's, of course, exactly what entrepreneurship is, as we saw from our definition. So property rights are very important. The second thing that's very important, and I don't want to sound like an old uh, conservative here, so we've got to be a little bit careful how we phrase this, but the size of the state sector is very important. Essentially, there are two issues here. The first is that the tax system is re reducing returns to entrepreneurship relative to paid employment. Right? If you have a highly progressive tax system, then entrepreneurship, where essentially you might receive a higher average income, but you actually stand a chance of a loss and a chance of a big earning, and then the tax system comes in and the big earning is heavily taxed, but you're not compensated in the loss. Right? The tax system therefore demotivates relative to paid employment. Secondly, and I've increasingly come to think, although I, I'm amazed I've come to think this, but I, I, it's just such a strong result and I spent ages trying to work it out. The welfare system is really very important in all of this. And I've tried, and we're going to see it again and again when I get to some more results. I think it's to do with the pension system. I think the thing about the pension system is it reduces savings. Uh, and the savings are the key. Savings and the transmission of savings to entrepreneurs are the key to uh, entrepreneurship, right? Uh, um, I will now show you, just to make the point, the most uh, important form of finance for an entrepreneur. It's their credit card. Um, and I will also say, because my sister is an entrepreneur, she's a serial entrepreneur, she, she fails on an utterly regular basis. Uh, every two or three years, there's another failed company. And there's two places you, fu uh, you fund yourself. The first is through your credit card, and the second is through your family. All right? Now, if your family isn't saving, if you're not saving, and your family isn't saving, uh, the supply of funds are damaged. I want to go back to property rights for a moment. Danny told me that uh, Darren uh, uh, Asimoglu came and gave a, a lecture here. Um, and I think I want to pick up on the, just bring out, I think, the main contribution of this book that some of you will know about. Uh, Darren's um, argument is that one should distinguish between two elements 
of institutions, two aspects. So I'm, so I'm going back, it's a slightly uh, complicated story, this. So I, I talked about property rights and the size of the state sector. I'm now back to property rights. And what I'm looking at is two ways of thinking about property rights. The first is the notion of rule of law, what I was just describing to you about um, the enforcement, essentially, of voluntary contract. But uh, Asimoglu and Robertson basically argue that they don't think that is the fundamental element of institutions. They think the fundamental element of institutions is um, a protection against expropriation. Your worry to them is that the, if, you, if you are successful, the state will take what you have created. Okay? And their whole book is essentially trying to argue that this is the dominant form of institution. Um, therefore, in empirical work will have for entrepreneurship, we'll have to look at both of these. How do we do that? Well, protection against expropriation, if you're interested, there's a data set called Polity now in its fourth version, Polity 4, which has a way of measuring that. The rule of law is a cluster of measures. You could look at legal origin. You guys live in an Anglo-Saxon legal system. Uh, uh, the French live in a, in a French legal system, and so on. If you're worried about issues like corruption, that's a rule of law measure. It's uh, uh, not a protection against expropriation measure. If you're concerned about protection of intellectual property rights, it's a rule of law measure. If you're concerned with the doing bank business measures of regulation, they're all rule of law. So there's lots of ways of getting at rule of law, only one or two ways of getting at expropriation. Okay, well, I think you've had enough uh, of the theory. Oh, no, you're going to have one more bit. No, you're not. Right. The key thing about this, as I said to you, I've got two ideas of institutions here. The size of the state, which is a... Uh, and quality of institutions, say rule of law for the moment. Now, what this picture shows you is they don't capture the same thing. You've got a bunch of countries with a big state sector and very strong rule of law. Think North Europe. Danny was telling me about Gothenburg. That's where they are, just here. Great place. Big state, strong rule of law. Then you've got a bunch of countries, Russia, China, Venezuela, Argentina, right? with very small state sector, okay, but not very good rule of law. And then you've got a bunch of countries up here, right, where you've got a strong rule of law and a relatively small state sector. So these things do not go together. They're capturing different things. Is that all right? This picture is trying to show you you cannot really, you can't even pin it down by GDP per capita, not very well. It's two distinct forms of institution. I'm not a bit worried about my timing, so I'm going to very quickly go through this. All I want to say about capital markets are another institution, a third institution. So you've got property rights, the size of the state, and the, and the depth and quality of the capital market. I've sort of made my main point on capital markets already. Everywhere, the lack or the cost of finance are seen as the main impediment to entrepreneurial activity, right? Entrepreneurs rely on their own money or family money, right? They don't have collateral, sort of by definition. Now, therefore, it's obviously the case that, that these things are related. A big state sector probably reduces the size of the capital market via the pension effect. A weak rule of law probably reduces the size of the capital market because capital markets are uncertain decisions and therefore... But nonetheless, it is a third dimension of institutions, semi-separate uh, uh, from the other two. What do we find? I, don't, I can't, couldn't get graphs that captured it, or rather I had too many graphs, so I'm going to summarise the findings from a number of papers, some of them mine, some of them from others. Well, we find that at all levels of development, because remember, you've got to control for the level of development, right? At all levels of development, uh, 
the size of the state sector, right, uh, bigger state sector reduces entrepreneurial activity. You find that property rights, stronger property rights, increase uh, entrepreneurial activity. This is particularly, this is true for both, uh, counter to the Asimoglu uh, uh, Robinson argument, this is not just true about freedom from expropriation, it's true for both approaches to thinking about uh, uh, property rights. Danny picked me up on this on the phone, so I'm going to stress it. Um, the rule of law, property rights don't really explain variation in developed countries, right? By the time you look at the top 10, 20% of countries, you can't use differences in property rights to explain differences in um, entrepreneurship. Japan has low entrepreneurship. Canada has high entrepreneurship. You can't really say, oh, it's because of the property rights system, right? We're going to have to look elsewhere to understand differences between developed countries. But institutions are terrifically important in explaining the differences between countries which are poor versus rich. And capital markets are very important, right? But funnily enough, more important for rich countries. That is to say, the size and depth of the capital markets is a major factor explaining differences between richer, um, uh, amongst richer countries, but not between richer and poorer countries. And this diagram summarizes, it's the only diagram I could construct that is relatively simple. This is the startup rate across countries. This is the government size when I've taken out the fact that the government, uh, that the size of the state sector is correlated to GDP per capita. Is that okay? Because you'll remember that, that entrepreneurship, right, goes down as GDP per capita goes up, and you'll remember that government size goes up as GDP per capita goes up, so there would be a spurious correlation. So you have to take that out. Is that okay? What you'll see here is it just pins down the results that there is, and this is the, these are the 95% significant lines, there is a clear effect that as the government sector gets smaller here, uh, sorry, larger, as the government sector gets smaller as we go up here, startup rates rise. Is that okay? Controlling for GDP per capita. What if I decide not just to look at, not just to look at um, all entrepreneurship, but only to look at what I'm calling high impact entrepreneurship? People who are trying to create big firms. Do our results change? Well, the answer is fundamentally not. This slide tries to capture it. As you go to create more complex entrepreneurial firms, the rule of law becomes more and more important. Unsurprising, but important, but significant. What about, so I've now dealt with GDP per capita entrepreneurship and institutions and entrepreneurship. And I've done so for high-powered or high-impact entrepreneurs and for all entrepreneurs. What about individual effects? What do they look like? This slide ca captures that. Essentially, the literature, everyone sort of agrees on this. You're, in every country, you're less likely to be an entrepreneur if you're a woman, if you're older, if you're less educated, or you're less well-networked. Right? And that's it. That's the individual characteristics. Education matters, gender matters, age matters, um, and actually experience matters, and your networks matter. And that's the big individual set of results. It applies in all societies, in all countries. No particular difference between developing and developed countries in this respect. Okay, let's get to female entrepreneurship. Now, female entrepreneurship also varies a lot from country to country. 
What's very interesting is that it varies a lot from... And I don't, I'm not promising I'm going to explain this as well. You're going to no doubt pick me up in the uh, questions. It varies a lot from country to country, but it doesn't necessarily vary in the same way as male entrepreneurship, right? So you've got some places which have quite low entrepreneurship but quite high female entrepreneurship, and other countries uh, with the converse. The cross-country variation is very large. The Japanese have more or less no female entrepreneurship and the Peruvians have masses of it. Female entrepreneurship is basically explained by the same things as male entrepreneurship, that is age, education. I forgot birth order. It's much better to be the eldest if you want to be an entrepreneur or the youngest in a bigger family um, and other such things. There do seem to be differences in financing. Women find it harder to be financed. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I need to check my um, little pictures here. Now, this gives the proportion of the ratio of female to male startups. So that as you go up this way, the ratio of female to male uh, is rising. So, you know, the, the country with the highest proportion of male to female, nearly 50-50 is Peru. It's as near as you get. Nowhere, nowhere oh no, Thailand in this year, particular year is, has more women than men, but in general it doesn't, right? And most countries are much lower. So you're going this way, right? And what you're getting is... More, a higher proportion of female entrepreneurship. Bear in mind, right, that the USA is a country with relatively high entrepreneurship. So the, so the number of women entrepreneurs is very high in the US because although only about one-third of entrepreneurs are female, there are quite a lot of entrepreneurs in, in the US relative to, say, Japan. Is that, is that okay? So this is the rule of law. Here, back to the rule of law. What I'm trying to show to you is that actually, this is a result that we can show statistically, there's no obvious relationship between the rule of law and male to female startup rates. We spent a lot of time talking about how entrepreneurship is related to the rule of law and institutions, but female entrepreneurship is not. Right? You've got a bunch of countries up here. Right, with quite high female entrepreneurship rates and quite bad, low rule of law. And you've got a bunch of countries here right, with quite low uh, entrepreneurship, female entrepreneurship and quite low rule of law. And you've got a bunch of countries here with quite low uh, female entrepreneurship and very good rule of law. There's just no relationship. Is that okay? The rule of law does not seem to affect female entrepreneurship. It affects entrepreneurship but not female entrepreneurship. And that captures this main result. The rule of law is important for entrepreneurship, but not female entrepreneurship. There are some important things, incidentally. There are some very specific bits of the legal code which are not very good for female entrepreneurship. There are some countries which impose freedom, uh, uh, restrictions on freedom of movement for women. And this, it will not surprise you, to learn is pretty bad for female <laughs> entrepreneurship. Uh, but it's also bad for all entrepreneurship. And it's not clear whether this is because uh, such societies that introduce such laws are culturally bad places for entrepreneurship, or whether uh, the laws impact. Female entrepreneurship is reduced by a large state sector. And that's true for all entrepreneurship and for high aspiration entrepreneurship. And interestingly, higher levels of maternity leave and for, of childcare reduce entrepreneurship, both for men and for women. So this is related to the, the state sector, the size of the state sector, but it's a specific element. So what I'm saying is that our results, what am I saying? We don't really know very well what these, is what I think I'm saying. We don't really know very well what is driving uh, female entrepreneurship it's not particularly GDP per capita. It's not particularly institutions. It is a bit the size of the state. 
right? And that relates to finance, but that doesn't really get us as far as one would like. And that just summarises this. My last topic is social entrepreneurship. And I've got time for this, Danny. My last topic is social entrepreneurship. I don't know how much you guys know about social entrepreneurship or whether this is being talked about or whether it's a big thing in Canada, I'm afraid. I should have checked, I suppose. Um, let's start with definitions. Uh, Eric um, uh, actually was one of the uh, co-editors of a... Uh, entrepreneurship theory and practice special issue on social entrepreneurship recently and actually we had a conference on it here, uh, I can't remember when but about a year or so ago um, I think commercial entrepreneurs I think we sort of know what they're about, they're about creating wealth for themselves and by implication wealth for uh, society social entrepreneurs uh, if you take the definition by Zara et al. Uh, um, are focusing more on social wealth, right? I'm um, uh, having social effects which are not necessarily counted financially. So social entrepreneurs might, for example, run a youth club that uh, helps in making sure that uh, prison offenders do not re-offend. Right? There, it is not commercially viable in any sense, but it clearly has a positive benefit for society. Social entrepreneurship, well, first of all, I should say the rates are always pretty low. Right? You may remember that we were looking in places like uh, uh, in, in some African countries of, of entrepreneurship rates of, you know, 35, 40%. Uh, the highest rate of uh, uh, prevalence of so social entrepreneurship is about 7.6%, and the lowest is negligible in, in Brazil, uh, uh, where there's almost no social entrepreneurship. This comes again from a survey in, in 2009, I think. Um, I've been involved at LSE in collecting across uh, Europe uh, data on social entrepreneurship and um, my guess is that the rates even within Europe vary quite a lot. The UK as you can see from this has relatively high rates of social entrepreneurship uh, as interestingly does Hungary but uh, um, Sweden has rather low rates of social entrepreneurship as does Germany and um, so the rates vary a lot uh, sorry, vary somewhat in a much narrower range the questions I want to ask of this, or my work has asked on this, is, and it's just an example really of a last stream of work, does social entrepreneurship enhance commercial entrepreneurship, both in terms of the national level and in terms of individuals? Well, I'm calling widening the funnel. Let's look at the data. As always, I'd like to start with the data. What do we observe? Well, this is the commercial entrepreneurship, this is uh, social entrepreneurship. If they were equal, the relationship between them would be a 45 degree line, and you can see that it isn't. Right? That is to say, you've got countries uh, like Denmark, poor old Denmark, up here, which really have very high social entrepreneurship and very low commercial entrepreneurship. Right? So, so... On the other hand, most of the countries that you would be thinking about in Europe are countries which sort of are on the 45 degree line. Social entrepreneurship and commercial entrepreneurship are fairly equal, but so you do have a bunch of countries along there. And then you've got a group of countries here, mainly um, uh, developing countries, where you've got quite a lot of social, uh, commercial entrepreneurship and very little social entrepreneurship. Okay? So, quite a lot of global variation. What's the sort of arguments we have here? Well, what I thought would be, what we thought would be quite interesting, the group of people I was working with and myself, we were interested in the idea that if you were in a country which had a lot of social entrepreneurship, Right? 
that would have an impact on how entrepreneurship generally was viewed. And as a result, the country would become more entrepreneurial in every way. There would be a spillover effect from the amount of social entrepreneurship there was to all entrepreneurship. Secondly, we thought that the sort of people who become social entrepreneurs are not at all the same as the sort of people who become commercial entrepreneurs. You just have to, I mean, I teach in, in, in you know, I teach at LSE. It's probably the only, only major university that you could imagine where the majority of students, when they come along and talk about entrepreneurship, want to become social entrepreneurs. Right? We are absolute majority of them. I'm sure here, or, or where I used to be at London Business School, maybe 25% might want to become social entrepreneurs, but most of them actually want to just become rather rich. Right? Uh, and the idea of helping society is at the moment a second order thing for them. Okay? Ha that means that social entrepreneurship appeals to different people. Now, one of the very interesting things is that social entrepreneur sorry, entrepreneurship is a skill, right? It requires learning a lot of things. And being a social entrepreneur or being a commercial entrepreneur, you learn most of those skills, managing finance, organizing, leadership, right? And one of the very interesting phenomena that one observes is people who start as social entrepreneurs, and they're much more likely to be women, and they're much more likely to be very highly educated, actually. Right, relative, I don't mean it's a major... Women are in a, in not in a majority in any form of on, any category of entrepreneurship, but they're nearer a majority in social entrepreneurship. Skills are learnt, experience is built up, confidence is built, and confidence is very important in entrepreneurship. Right? Networks are created, and then the question is, would social entrepreneurship at the individual le level lead later to commercial entrepreneurship? And lastly, we have the standard question about whether institutions matter. What do we find? Well, it's quite interesting, really. I'll start at the last one. Institutions don't seem to matter for social entrepreneurship. Institutions don't seem to matter for female entrepreneurship, and they don't seem to matter for social entrepreneurship. They do matter for entrepreneurship, commercial entrepreneurship. The second thing is, the second, the two things we confirm. There is a positive spillover effect. Countries which have more social entrepreneurship have more commercial entrepreneurship. One, individuals who become social entrepreneurs are more likely later to become commercial entrepreneurs. So those spillover effects hold. Well, I've gone through a lot of stuff rather quickly, I think. Let me try and summarise. Firstly... I hope I've made you see, entrepreneurial activity varies a lot by form and by country. I've indicated, and I think Bamel's made this, uh, brought this point out very well, but it is, you shouldn't, one shouldn't forget it. It's not automatically the case that entrepreneurship is a good thing. Right? Thirdly, it's issues of Education, which I talked about only briefly in individual education, institutions and policy are very important in understanding the diversity. The size of the state seems to be a very important variable. The rule of law and property rights is especially important for high-impact entrepreneurship. The role of the financial markets is important everywhere. And encouraging social entrepreneurship will lead to a broader level of commercial entrepreneurial activity. For emerging markets, you need to think about institutions that don't uh, improve institutions without damaging incentives. That's the key, the key trade-off that's coming here. And for developed economies, you've got to think about financial markets, and you really have to think about female entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship as a mechanism for enhancing all entrepreneurship. Now, there's two things I haven't talked about, right? And we could, you know, I could, it wasn't the time. One is education, the second is culture, right? I think both of them are very important. They're somewhat related. 
to understanding country differences. We did see that more educated people become entrepreneurs, but of course it isn't the case that just by increasing education you increase entrepreneurship. My colleague uh, uh, Miriam van Prague in, in Holland uh, has been doing a very, very interesting experiment in which is trying to address the question, you know, a lot of people, entrepreneurs especially, come up to me, you know, and they say, uh, well, you know, you're going on and on about this entrepreneurship. You can't teach entrepreneurship, you know, you're born it. It's not true, right? What she has done is, is followed children from the age of five, a matched experiment of classes, some of them exposed from a very early age to positive images of entrepreneurship on the one hand and training to business, and the others not. And there are clearly significant differences 15 or 20 years later in the amount of entrepreneurship you see in the two groups. It, to, to a very significant extent, education and environment are important. Culture is also important, right? And I will end with this. Um, um, Russia is one of the least entrepreneurial countries in the world and has been for a very long time. Now, some of that is to do with its institutions and particularly the rule of law. Some of that is to do with its level of development. Some of that is to do with the BAML type question, non-productive uh, investment. But social attitudes are very, very important. In the communist era, which lasted from 1917, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneur was the same as criminal. Right? It was not, there was no clear distinction drawn between a criminal and an entrepreneur. And while communism fell 20 years ago, cultures change very slowly, right? And so even now, it's most interesting that, not that I regard this as exactly definitive of uh, 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 cultural ranking, but it is very interesting how lowly ranked entrepreneurship is uh, in Russia as a potential profession. And with that, I end. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm, I'm delighted to take questions. I, I, how do you want to do it? I'm going to leave it up to you. So Saul, Saul will take his own questions, and I will continue to relax. <laughs> Don't toes off again, though. Um, any questions? Yeah. Just a, a question of clarification about, um, it seemed from the graph I was looking at that in Peru and in Thailand, press your button. It's, it seemed that the ratio of female entrepreneurship in Peru and Thailand was actually higher than, uh, was actually quite high. Yes, Let's very see high. Here. Yeah. Almost 50-50. Okay. So, okay, so you're just within that caveat that female entrepreneurship is always less than male. I'm just wondering, can you give us a bit of insight of what's happening in those countries? No. Uh, so I, I can't, actually. I, I, um, this is one year, right, and... and my empirical work typically covers 10 to 15 years. So these diagrams are useful to giving you the blocks, but, but I don't think you can pick on particular countries because actually it varies a lot from year to year. I don't, I mean, I think Peru does have a lot of female entrepreneurship, and I honestly don't know why. Hmm. Thailand, I really don't know. So, um, I mean, I'm trying to look at broader cross-country relationships rather than understanding in depth Thanks. a country. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, like there was one slide um, with a statement uh, saying that uh, the lack of finance uh, is a major impediment to en entrepreneurship. Uh, and then uh, in the same time, like there was a graphic uh, of a list of countries where uh, like a percentage of the population evolved into entrepreneurship. Like uh, the first, um, like um, uh, the first level countries, which um, like uh, had the highest percentage were countries in Africa. Uh, so it means that uh, in Africa they don't care about uh, the lack of finance. Um, somehow, like uh, every second or third person is 
listed as entrepreneur? Yes. Uh, it is a little bit hard in these things where several things are going on at once. Um, clearly, the opportunity cost of entrepreneurship is much lower in some of these African, well, in, in less developed countries. Um, because incomes are much lower, because employment levels are much, much lower. And that does lead a lot of people to do this. And they, as you would expect, most of these entrepreneurs require very little or no capital for the activities they're undertaking. Secondly, um, I mean, I don't want to get uh, too bogged down in this. While I can't particularly talk about individual countries, we can talk about categories of country. In general, in developing countries, there, there are very well-developed informal capital markets which replace uh, the formal capital markets you'd see in, in more developed countries. And so, relative to the level of income, I don't think capital market development, relative to the level of income, right, I don't think you'd say that capital market is, is much weaker, right? I, it's quite different, as you'd expect, because these are much less developed countries, and it works, operates in complete different forms, right? It's, it, it, you know, it operates in an informal way. But I think um, um, capital markets are important. The provision of capital, it's not capital markets, the provision of capital is key everywhere. Hmm? Second question. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> I would keep going. Um, like, um, you listed uh, strong uh, state and rule of, sl rule of law um, on one slide, um, which, um, um, which is conducted for entrepreneurship. Um, like, um, there's a lack of... Um, in my opinion, lack of uh, the role of uh, criminal uh, criminal organizations, like large criminal organizations. Uh, for example, in um, Italy, they have the mafia. Um, like it's um, this rule of law in the country, but uh, like there are large criminal enterprises as well. And um, in the same way, like in Russia, like there's a strong, very strong state. And in the same time, like there are criminal organizations. Um, so that that's uh, is an impediment for entrepreneurship. Like um, people will, will think why, why start a business when they have to pay for protection and... Um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think your question illustrates what I was trying to say about the difference between uh, the rule of law and freedom from expropriation which I think is an important distinction, right? I mean, you just said Russia has a strong state. I think most people would say that Russia has a very weak state. Um, in the sense that I'm trying to define the state, it's, it plays a very small role in the economy, right? And the rule of law in Russia is rather poor. But the threat of expropriation is quite high, right? So what I, uh, the, what I was trying to say with, with these graphs is that, that when you start thinking about institutions, you've got to get used to the idea there's not a continuous, there's not a continuum. You can't just say, these are good institutions and these are bad institutions and let's lay out every country on a line like that, right? What you've actually got is a number of different dimensions and countries are in different places on different parts of those dimensions. And this graph was showing actually two of what I see as the fundamental dimensions. There are three dimensions. One is the size of the state, the second is the rule of law, and the third is the freedom uh, from expropriation. I've only, I, I'm not very good at 3D diagrams, so there's only two here. Um, but you, you, it's that complexity that I think one has to bring out to understand. Now, the point about entrepreneurship is it's damaged by all three. Right, but separately damaged by all three. In other words, perhaps the thing that causes the trouble in Russia is indeed the threat of expropriation. But the big problem in, say, Nigeria is perhaps the failures of the rule of law. I mean, it's oversimplified to say the big problem, but you see, I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, it's a bit hard to choose any one country in this sort of thing. 
because it's a cross-country analysis, but that's the sort of point I'm trying to make. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, could you go back to the female um, chart? Because you mentioned that there's no correlation, but it seems like you have two clusters. Yeah, you got two clusters. And I don't need the chart to show that. You've got two clusters. <laughs> Well, so it seems that all but four of the ones in the top cluster are former colonies, and in the bottom cluster, you pretty much have all of um, Europe and, let's say, the old world. Um, do you think that, you know, we could find something there explaining those differences? Not easily. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry, I think if you're going an Asimoglu Robinson route you'd be quite tempted to because you'd start talking about the nature of the former colonies and you'd be talking about the institutions that co the colonies left and so on and so forth. But I, I, I'm afraid I think... It might have been more interesting if I put on the bottom axis not the rule of law but just the amount of entrepreneurship. And then I think you'd, you wouldn't, it would have been a better diagram to answer your question. And at that point, it wouldn't have looked like this. Right. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, fascinating presentation. Uh, but uh, one of the things you said that most surprised me, um, if I understood you correctly, was that social entrepreneurship is not influenced by the size of the state. Uh, if I'm right that you said that. It... it it surprised me because you would think in a smaller state the demand and opportunity for social entrepreneurship would be higher. At least that's what I would think. But my question goes more to a logical question or, or logic problem I have. If commercial entrepreneurship is influenced by the size of the state, which I think you also said, and social entrepreneurship is not influenced by the size of the state, yet you say commercial and social entrepreneurship are intertwined, how can it be that they're not both correlated to the size of the state if they're intertwined? It seems to me if they, if, if they track each other and if one goes one way relative to the size of the state, the other should as well. So I'm having trouble sorting that out. Yes. Uh, you're not the only one that had trouble. My referees had a lot of problem with this point, <laughs> as it happens. Um, if I'm going to, I don't promise I'll remember both of your points. I'd like to deal with them one at a time. I think um, it is a bit surprising. Um, a lot of people would have thought, uh, there's a whole literature that you may have heard across about called the institutional void literature. And that would, which sort of, it characterize, the way it, they, they characterize emerging markets is not on a continuum of institutions of different dimensions, but basically saying that there's a series of institutions in developed countries and there are voids, there are holes, there are gaps in emerging markets. And that framework, that particularly that framework, would lead you to believe that social entrepreneurship, <laughs> there'd be more opportunities for social entrepreneurship in an environment in which the state was weaker. Right, and that m would lead you, therefore, to expect um, um, a, co a correlation that way. Right. Um, now we don't find that, um, and I don't. I, I don't think we have a terrifically good explanation for why we don't find that. It's just, I, I mean, and that leads me to the second uh, point. Um, Social entrepreneurship, at least at the scale that we're beginning to see it, is a very new phenomenon. A very new phenomenon. I mean, it really was negligible, I think, eight or ten years ago as a phenomenon. Um, now, the data that we're collecting takes the form of social entrepreneurship is beginning to appear. The results are that social entrepreneurship supports commercial entrepreneurship, but there's no evidence the other way around. It isn't... You were talking about a cycle, but it isn't a cycle, not yet at least, because social entrepreneurship is coming from who knows where, right? And uh, it is apparently then leading people to become commercial entrepreneurs 
but we aren't yet seeing the feedback loop the other way. Now, my colleague uh, Zoltan Axe takes the view that you shouldn't really expect it to, to go the other way, that commercial entrepreneurs, the cycle for commercial entrepreneurs is they separate out the commercial from the social. And the social side they deal with through philanthropy. So you create Microsoft, you make a lot of money, you create the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Gates Foundation, and then you run it. And, and that is not a social enterprise. It's a philanthropic activity. Right? So the cycle, it's, it, he would argue that you won't ever see a relationship where commercial supports social. You only see a relationship where commercial, uh, social supports commercial. So that cycling, either it's too early yet to find it, or you won't see it because of the philanthropy point. I don't know whether that's answered. I mean, at least getting at your question. Any more? Yes. One more. One more. Uh, your, uh, your comments on education and culture really resonated with me. Uh, the visual slide with the Russian woman where they place her entrepreneurship at the bottom of the level, I'm, I'm interested in what, what nations or countries place entrepreneurship at the very top. U.S. I think... Um, I'm not promising to get this exactly right, but I think uh, the countries which really place entrepreneurship very highly are the US, to some extent the UK, and some of the Scandinavian countries, notably Finland, um, and those, and Australia. So, the, 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 you know, the, the Anglo-Saxon countries and some of the Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Uh, I'm um, going to, sorry interrupt because uh, there is food waiting outside. Saul is willing and able to uh, answer the rest of the questions out, out there and it's been a bit of a long evening so I think uh, uh, it is time to, to uh, end it by thanking Saul for what I uh, uh, was sure was uh, an exciting and stimulating presentation. Saul, this is something to take home. Wow. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.